Welcome to Under the Fig Tree Podcast. In today's episode, hosts Rev. Micah Glenn and Rev. Dr. Ben Haupt sit down with a special guest as they meditate under the fig tree. What's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome back to part two of our episode of Under the Fig Tree with Dr. Kolb as we continue our conversation of Reformation history and uh, just the history behind the role of the pastor in the local congregation and more uh, with Dr. Kolb under the fig tree. I, I recently came across a little article that you wrote, I think maybe in the Lutheran Witness, um, where you talked about um, six different writings that Luther had put forward um, in the, the, what, 1520s that were kind of programmatic for his vision for where the church needed to go. Um, I, I'm always interested for our listeners um, the kind of further reading, um, mm-hmm. and, and we get the question a lot, uh, if I'm, if I'm going to prepare for seminary a little bit, what should I read? What should I study? Um, these Those six essays kind of... Um, they, they are Luther's vision for how we transition from this kind of medieval system of sacrifice, uh, doing works in order to appease a wrathful God in order to, and then switching to um, his evangelical approach uh, through the gospel. Um, thoughts on those, those six writings, how they fit? Do, do I have that right, that there's maybe six? I think so, and I'll explain what why I think there's double the number. We used to talk about the three great reformational writings. Yeah. It depends on whether you want to follow the model of the 16th century students or the 19th and 20th century students. Mm-hmm. If you want to go with the 16th century students, read his Galatians commentary, especially 1530. He gave the lectures in 1531. Students edited them and published them in 1535. Uh, that's volumes 26 and 27 of... Um, Luther's works in English, uh, that, that's just a great read, and you get to the heart, I think, of, of Luther's faith. You don't get all the detail, though, that you mm-hmm. get in the, in mm-hmm. the six uh, earlier writings. Uh, and then his Genesis commentary was a, a big favorite among his, uh, among the ne- in the next generation of his students, and maybe the next two generations. And that's volumes uh, one to eight. Uh, that's a major project. But even just reading volume one of Luther's works in English, mm-hmm. um, there you get creation and fall, and, and that, that's really rich stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but from the b- middle of the 19th century, uh, there have been an emphasis on three writings in in 1520, uh, an open letter to the German nobility uh, calling for specific reforms, uh, a prelude on the Babylonian captivity of the church, um, which is about the sacramental system and, and the, the role of the pastor as priest and all, and then the freedom of a Christian. Well, I think you can't really see those three without seeing also a, a longer work that had had come just before uh, the f- first of those on the on the German uh, le- open letter to the German nobility on good works, mm-hmm. and then you've got sort of <coughs> two follow-ups. Um, uh, I think you need also to get that sort of full program his writing against uh, a theologian named Latomus. So it's called Contra Latomus uh, in English, or against Latomus. That really outlines some of the major objections of a major Roman traditional Catholic, traditional medieval theologian, uh, Jacob Latomus, who taught at Leuven in, in what is now Belgium. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then his On Monastic Vows. Yeah. Um, that, that kind of brings that series um, uh, together. What he does in On Good Works is to talk about, a, he's really constructing a new evangelical piety. Mm-hmm. Then in on, uh, Open Letter to the German Nobility, he, he really deconstructs uh, 30-some pious practices. Mm. Um, particularly financial abuses in the church. In the prelude on the Babylonian captivity of the church, prelude, 
on the baptism, uh, on the Babylonian captivity of the church. Uh, he talks about uh, his doctrine of the word, essentially, and why the seven sacraments um, and our observance, our performance of, or our attendance at the mass and our going through the ritual motions, um, why that needs to be deconstructed. And then his, his really great, great stroke of genius, I think, comes in on Christian freedom, the last of those four, 15, they were all issued in 1520. That uh, really puts together an understanding of Christian faith and life that I think is still probably the first thing I would have somebody read if they want to get into Luther. Hmm. Um, yeah, the great first line of, of that is just uh, marvelous, that yeah. um, the, the, the Christian is uh, subject to all and yet um, free, well, Lord he, of all. he says, yeah, Lord of all and, and subject of none, and, and yet also um, subject to to all. Yeah. 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 What I think we, we don't always see is um, that his concept of freedom is freedom from all our enemies that oppress us, mm -hmm. the, the devil, the wrath of God, and so forth. Uh, although in 1520, he wasn't so, um, so much concerned about the devil. Mm. So the devil isn't mentioned uh, in, on Christian freedom. The devil really comes to play a very prominent role in his theology after 1521 when he's excommunicated and uh, mm. outlawed by the emperor. Uh, then, then he really sees the very personal nature of evil wow. in the person of Satan. And that's uh, Heiko Obermann, who was a professor at Harvard and then Tübingen in Germany and then at uh, the University of Arizona, wrote, um, I think, a very good study of, of Luther's life called um, Martin Luther, Man Between God and the Devil. And, and that, that's really a good description. Um, but at any rate, you've got uh, then, um, in those six works, you've got really a kind of overview. I think Luther, the, the Luther scholars have been arguing for a century over when he had his tower experience or his mm -hmm. evangelical breakthrough. And I, uh, I told probably you two in class, um, I think the evangelical breakthrough took place in the late 19th, early 20th century <laughs> when <laughs> scholars in, uh, influenced by 19th century romanticism thought that like Wilhelm Leov, like um, uh, Louis Harms in Hermannsburg, some of the great leaders of, of conservative Lutheranism um, had a, 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 an awakening experience. Mm -hmm. they, they had a conversion experience. So Luther needed one too. I don't think he had one. I think he had uh, maybe three stages of development, but he was, he was working on putting the whole thing together. I think the core was together by about 1521-22. But he and his uh, friend Philip Melanchthon and their colleagues in Wittenberg continued to regard their, their uh, pulpits and their, their uh, lecture stands uh, at the university as laboratories. They were continually mm. experimenting with how best to say what they found in scripture. Mm. Um, so at any rate, it, th these six, I think, represent a, 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 an avenue to get at that core that really is underlying then all the different ways in which they find to express uh, their their message, their understanding of the Bible. So helpful. Well, and what you just said about laboratories for best explaining uh, what God's Word says to us. So, of course, we, we have the Book of Concord, uh, which many Lutherans haven't read, which is fair. It's a lot. It's dense. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's a compilation of writings during Luther's life, after Luther's life. Uh, you and Tom Wingert... Uh, Tim, Tim, sorry, Wingert. Tim Wingert, sorry. Uh, is your edition probably the most late edition that we use in the LCMS? Um, the Concordia Reader's edition actually the appeared oh, after gotcha. after that, but it didn't use the. the it, it was basically a reproduction of of the Benti okay uh, work with with some updating, 
a nice pictures. Sure. We don't have pictures in, in our translation. But we, our, our translators were using some of the very latest scholarship. Right. The previous translation by, um, edited by uh, Theodore Tappert um, was, uh, well, it was, it was composed in the mid-1950s. Okay. And there has been a, just a rash. I, my area is particularly the formula of Concord a rash of research between um, 1955 and 1995 that our translators could take into account. So sure. uh, we have, for instance, references to, to Luther's works in English and to um, the translations particularly of Martin Chemnitz uh, and, and introductions that reflect the latest scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I used to ask this question as a, a student just because... Um, Context and language, right, changes over time, and it's inevitable. And this isn't by any means to say that, because the Book of Concord are, are articles of faith, uh, that they're insufficient in any such way. But I would always ask this question, is there any value not to write a new Book of Concord, uh, but for us to continue to add to articles of faith to on a subscription-type level, mm -hmm. if that makes sense? Yeah. Well, um, I get that question in class practically every time sure. I teach the confessions. And, uh, and my answer always is, it's not our call. We don't make confessions. We mm -hmm. confess. If the Holy Spirit chooses to have the church make uh, one of our statements of confession of the faith, authoritative uh, on that secondary level, uh, scripture alone is the primary authority right. for us, but... Uh, on that secondary level, uh, he will do it. Uh, Lutherans tried in the mid-17th century. There was a repetition of the formula of Concord or Book of Concord, or I forget exactly what it was, a repetition of Tim Schmeling at, at um, Bethany uh, Seminary in Mankato did a fine dissertation for us on that a few years ago. Um, uh, they tr they tried to make that authoritative on that l the, on the level of the of the confessions in the Book of Concord, and uh, and nobody but the S Saxons who were subject to the Elector of Saxony at the time um, accepted it. Sure. And, and and some who agreed doctrinally, but just said no, we're not going to start tampering with the Book of Concord. Um, in some ways, I think when I was a student, we regarded the brief statement of 1932 as a, as a, on the level of, of the Book of Concord. And um, I, I know that some of, some of the teachers of our church, uh, not on this faculty, but um, have really openly uh, said no to a, a couple of articles um, where I think it's right, but we have some healthy disagreements. Uh, so uh, I, I think we can say that the Holy Spirit decided in those two instances, nice try, but sure. no thanks. Um, so I think what we have to instill in our people is that, that by its very nature, the Lutheran understanding of Christianity is one that takes the, the great commissions at the end of all four Gospels mm. uh, seriously. And, and gets the word out uh, beyond our own little narrow uh, circle. Um, when I came and started working at the Institute for Mission Studies, our president at that time, John Johnson, said every one of our pastors is going into a missionary situation. Too many of our pastors in the Missouri Synod today, I think, don't realize that. Sure. But that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, I, I mean, the, the the task of Christian witness starts at home. We, we've we talked about having more babies as a solution to our numbers uh, problem, but the real numbers problem is, is keeping the babies we ha already have. Right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we've got to solve that problem, but I think that's what I find so exciting about our faculty. We're working on that. Mm -hmm. How do we take the biblical message as understood within the the really helpful uh, and accurate lens uh, that provided by Luther and Melanchthon 
and uh, the confessors of the uh, formula of Concord. How do we make that alive for people in, in the United States or wherever we go in the world today? As a student, I would ask that question. I just figured while we were on the topic, I'd ask it for our listeners. So if you do come here, just understand the answer you're probably going to get from all of us. It's just one of these things where one of my favorite things now as a pastor uh, that brings me the, the, some of the greatest joy is when somebody's going through the Luther small catechism for the first time. And I always read the opening sentence as a father should teach uh, his household to open it. And then we get into it and they're like, their minds are blown. Yeah. And I'm, in, a, in a, a non-pejorative way, I'm like, this is very incredible. And I always, every time I go back and reread Luther's small catechism, there's another little nugget that I took for granted the other times I read it. And explain to people, it's like he wrote this, like if you were to ask my three children, maybe not David just yet, but certainly Talitha, who is, she's seven, but she's a burgeoning theologian. This young lady <laughs> loves her Bible and reads it for half an hour before she goes to bed every night. Oh, neat. Uh, and even our son, Jonathan, and being able to have conversations with them about life, the world, yeah. their faith, and things like that. I'm like, if you were to ask uh, at least my older two children, and to some respect, David, what they believe, you're going to get answers similar to this. I was like, because that's just the beautiful thing. You don't have to be a, an academic to understand, receive, and bear the fruit of God's word. Yeah, It can be as simple for you today as it was for you when you were seven years old, and it's that sufficient. And that's, as I grow and mature as a theologian, I look at the Book of Concord, I feel the same way. It's like, well, you know, okay, the, the context of the world has changed. But look at what they're saying about the world. Yeah. That hasn't changed at all. Yeah. Uh, the brokenness, the, everybody, I get the same question when we're going through Old Testament or New Testament. Do I think the world is more sinful than it was that back then? I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure it's as sinful as it was when Adam and Eve first disobeyed God. Yeah. It just looks differently. But if you yeah. look at what's going on in Judges all the way through uh, Revelation, like it, it all just kind of looks the same to me. Just yeah. maybe the scale looks different this day or that day, but they're dealing with all the things that we are dealing with today. It's a matter of how do we, like you said, like Paul, put our context, what we're comfortable uh, aside for the sake of our neighbor. Yeah. Uh, so that they can hear and receive God's word in the way that we do. How does the neighbor rephrase the questions mm. that from Moses through Isaiah, through John and Paul, have been have been raised and continue to be raised simply by the general sinful condition of the world. Sure. Yeah. Ben, you got your phone out. I got my phone out because um, I wanted to mention, you're, you're talking about mission, mm. um, jogged my mind to something that I, I have... Um, I think is one of the most helpful things that you've put forward that I've used in a number of settings. And, um, but I, I couldn't put my finger on the, the title of it. And so I, I had to, uh, <laughs> bringing Christ to the neighbor. This was a, a workshop that you did on evangelism. And um, it's, it is uh, eminently usable um, by, by anybody. Um, and and uh, but it, what it really what I really love about the bringing Christ to the neighbor and it's available on on our website um, scholar.csl.edu is you have this this chart of seven ways to have conversations about Christ and Christ's work um, and it it kind of helps you to um, speak. Uh, this gospel that Luther articulated so well, in to, to seven different people facing different circumstances, different challenges, um, and I just uh, I really really appreciate your mission heart and how you've helped the church to um, articulate the message of Christ in really helpful, clear ways um, to. A, a variety of people facing a variety of circumstances, and I just wanted to throw that out for our our um, our listeners and our our viewers that bringing Christ to the neighbor is a great resource. Thank you. Um, that that really arose out of a, a faculty assignment when I was teaching at Concordia uh, University in St. Paul. Uh, we organized a director of Christian outreach a program at the 
Oswald Hoffman School of Christian Outreach, as it was called in those days. Um, and I wanted to use law gospel because I'm a Lutheran and Lutherans don't do anything else but law gospel uh, stuff. Um, the problem is that, that the, the law always accuses and people aren't listening to the accusation today. So how do you get into the conversation? Yeah. And Luther's got a line in the small cult articles, so one of the confessions of the church, uh, in which he sa is talking about repentance and he uses Jeremiah 23, 29, uh, the gospel, uh, or the, the word of God comes as a hammer that smashes to smithereens. And uh, as, as one of my uh, students uh, defined it, uh, and, and I thought the law not only always accuses whether we listen to it or not, the law is always crushing us mm. because of our sinful ways. So what, how do people experience the crushing of the law? Yeah. And, um, and I think I had five maybe, and students, again, I learned from my students, what good are students if they don't do the professor's work for him, I say. Um, as, as Mike is experiencing now, as I try to get some uh, new glimpses of justification uh, through the seminar he's taking from me. Um, but uh, so the, I, I came up with these seven dilemmas. Uh, the, first of all, there's an eighth now on the newest form of the chart, mm. which says there are people that just aren't interested. What do you do with them? Uh, they, their false gods are working well. Um, you don't do anything, you just are their friend. And yep. you're there, and, and you don't hide your Christianity, but you don't smother them in it. Um, but then there are evils outside us that unsettle us, and, and there are uh, addictions mm -hmm. that we can't really help, uh, but we still feel guilty or ashamed or whatever. Um, and then there's alienation, and there's meaninglessness, and there's just the dumb little things we do, as well as the larger things we're guilty for. And finally, there's death. Mm. And, and there are different approaches in each of those to the way we can start the conversation. Yeah. And it's going to be different when people are still pretty secure with their false gods and have life, they think, together in just a little bit of thinking about uh, whether it's really going to work. Uh, and then when they fall into something closer to despair, maybe not full despair, but uh, then there's another way we can talk with them. And then there, are, the Bible is so rich, we sometimes yeah. reduce the gospel, and, and, and it's so rich. Uh, uh, my dear friend and, and colleague, uh, Jack Preuss uh, III, who, who unfortunately just died this last year, uh, wrote a book called Just Words yeah. that just that just uh, really expands your ability to, um, to uh, I hate um, making verbs out of nouns, but to synonymize, to make synonyms uh, for um, uh, the forgiveness of sins or justification or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've found that um, the whole spirit of the Augsburg Confession is to let the world know what we believe. And, and Lutherans in this country, I think, or German Lutherans especially, got a habit of being shy about that. Mm. And that's all gone out of our history, I think, or out of our consciousness. It's not gone out of our history. But what's replaced it then is just an American reluctance to talk about religion. Um, we talk about everything else that val we value, yeah. restaurants, mm. cars, uh, and so forth, uh, that we can't talk about Jesus is um, is obviously something demonic because it's not uh, n not natural. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So good. We could just keep this. I, I'm 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 like uh, just basking. Well, um, it's just fun to. Well, it's fun to talk about Jesus, and it's fun to talk about what Jesus has done through the history of the church and. Uh, so rich, but but we should probably get on to um, 
a segment that sure. all of our viewers and listeners love. Which gonna, is in a month, I get this for two hours a day, so it's all right. right. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're we're getting close to the end of our, our time together, uh, at least for this episode of our podcast. And so we're we have a, a segment called "Right for the Pick and Leave It on the Tree" or "Under the Fig Tree," where uh, we have a list. Now Ben has a running list uh, of just things that. Uh, pop to our heads we're just interested to see what you think about it. it's easily the most subjective part of this podcast and uh, therefore the most controversial and divisive at times uh but yeah if you like it it is ripe for the picking if you don't like it just leave it on the tree for somebody else to pick uh one time we did pick figs i don't know there's a fig trees on this campus yeah i, yeah. I did not know until yeah. ben pointed them out and I, I ate a fig for the first time oh it's all right, right. It, I don't know if it was out of season. It, you got to you got to get yeah. Our our the, the, the figs were really little, and oh. um, England actually is where I've had the best figs. These oh. big, uh, brown, uh, ripe. Well, it's, I always have to dispel. Love figs. This time in England, if you go there right now, a it's going to be dark soon. Well, there right now is already dark and it'll be wet and cold. Yeah. But South England is, is tropical because of some Atlantic current. Yeah. And so yeah. you can find a very nice climate in England if you are willing to be away from the city, which yeah. you should be. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so I'll go first. Why sure. not? Because my phone it. is already open. Oh, well, yours is. Anyway. Uh, so right for the picking or leave it on the tree, road trips. Uh, what kind of road trips? Any kind of road trips? Uh, so, I, yeah, that's interesting. And so, in a a vehicle like on a a road with Just four wheels, going someplace. so like yeah, yeah. So like right, I'm thinking like when uh, we did road trips in the UK, but they were always by a train. Yeah, but, but I'm not going to count that because that's a little too luxurious. Being in the car, <laughs> screaming kids in the back who have to go yeah. to the bathroom every ten seconds—that type of road trip. At least that's yeah. my experience currently. Well, well, if you can screen out the, uh, the those uh, <laughs> kinds of factors and the the dumb driver ahead of you and and so forth, uh, again, you just see the wonders of God's creation. Mm. Yeah. Um, you see, you also see sometimes um, what what human sinners have done to God's creation in, a, in, a, mm, in yeah. an unfortunate way. But, um, but uh, it, again, getting out of the place you are and seeing other places is always great. I, I was introduced to figs, really, in southern France, mm. where they uh, fill the menu uh, <laughs> in fig season. Yeah. And uh, it, th they're, they're a real treat. Well, so I... I I would have a completely different attitude toward figs if I hadn't taken a road trip, actually. I got oh, there sure. by car, didn't fly uh, from Germany into France. So, uh, yeah, I, I think road trips are to be recommended despite. Sure. Yeah, I, it, they're ripe for the picking for me, too. I've, um, I've been on lots of road trips. I've, I've uh, driven. Um, I, I once drove nonstop from Mequon, Wisconsin, to... Uh, to uh, Yellowstone National oh. Park. Um, we stopped uh, to get gas and to eat. We stopped at uh, Salem uh, in North Dakota where there is the Salem Sioux cow that huh. you see kind of uh, up on a, a nice hill. Um, <laughs> this huge <laughs> statue of a cow. Um, these are the crazy kinds of things that yeah. you see on road trips. And um, yeah, I've been on lots of uh, Greyhound bus adventures. Sure. Um, I'll, so, I'll, 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 I'll yeah. uh, buses fly because that's also a different experience. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, fair, that's yeah. Fair. It's not that's not luxury. Well, anyway, not knocking any bus companies out there. <laughs> they're, I mean, they're very right for us. I mean, because a we have three kids, so flying anywhere yeah. is expensive. But we just enjoy it. And for some of the heartache and crying on the trip, we we have a minivan thanks to modern technology with a DVD player. And we have a very large DVD library that we typically rotate. But this last road trip in the summer, we banned the TV. We said no electronics. Uh, and we would play books. And when they got tired of the books, we put on um, music. Look out the window. Yeah. Enjoy God's creation. So, yeah, they're very right for us. We love road trips. All right. Next one is Pfeffernusse. So these German cookies that often come out uh, at Christmas time. Yeah. Um, sometimes covered in powdered sugar, mm -hmm. um, and, and have a distinct 
licorice taste. I, I know that I, I wouldn't have to describe Pfeffernissa for you, but yeah. for, our, for our viewers and listeners, um, many of them may not have had a Pfeffernuss cookie. I haven't been in Germany at Christmas time since the late 1990s hmm. when our family visited um, uh, the f- family of a, of a colleague and spent a delightful time. Uh, but I have been there, uh, I got back, what, a week ago or so, so I have been there into the Advent season yes. when Christmas begins. Actually, Christmas, uh, as in the United States, uh, happens. So in, in Germany, the commercial uh, sales, particularly of the of the goodies, of the sweets, yes. uh, start yes. in October now. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I think there are some German tastes that, Again, it's a matter of taste, I suppose, <laughs> but it really is a matter of taste. And, and uh, uh, so Leibkuchen, uh, uh, Pfeffernisse, uh, all those kinds of things, uh, certain kinds of, of um, meat preparations and all. Um, uh, the German materialist philosopher, uh, well, he was an idealist, actually, but... Uh, Lutri Feuerbach said, "One is what one eats. <laughs> it it's, goes better in German. Man ist was man isst." Nice. Um, yeah, uh, there is there is a certain a truth to that 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 that's just inborn, and um, you know, encounter people who don't like the taste of certain things. Yeah. Um, but what, especially what you've sort of done for years and years. I didn't grow up with. Well, I did grow up actually in Iowa with some of those things, some of the Norwegian things of my mother's side of the family, mm, mm-hmm. uh, hot and caca and, and uh, so forth. So, yeah, I think, uh, again, we see, uh, I, I don't think theologically about everything, but <laughs> as long as we're talking in this context, um, you really see another one of the wonders of God's creation that he, he gives access to through taste buds. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, Pfeffernissa are absolutely ripe for the picking for me. Yeah. I um I love black licorice. I, I was always the kid at Easter time that would eat everybody else's black <laughs> jelly beans. And um I in fact I have a bag of black licorice uh sitting on my desk yeah. right now. Yeah. And I so um Pfeffernus cookies, Leibkuchen, um anything that tastes like licorice, um Give me, give me as much of it as as uh, as I can get. Yeah, love it. I don't, I don't hate. My wife black hates licorice. it. Yeah, I, I would leave it on the tree to be honest with you. <laughs> I like, I can eat one black licorice flavored thing maybe every couple of years just for that refresh. Mm. It's not, it's not like a, it's not like a gonna create a gag reflex. It's like, oh, okay, black licorice, move on. Actually, I think. That what goes into Pfeffernissa and Leibkuchen and those kinds of things isn't licorice itself, but there's a, a strong sure. similarity. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of it precisely the, the spice that. Um, uh, oh, it's probably like, uh, anise or something a, like yeah, that. Yeah, anise maybe or fennel. No, there well, fennel is be. anise. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I, which I don't necessarily hate fennel and things because mm. it's, it's not like Love I said it. a part of a thing. It's it's when the licorice is like the, like a black licorice when it's that's the flavor. Yeah, right? I'm, I'm just I'm good on it. And a and a and a fennel tea is really good. Mm. Can be yeah. puts you to puts you to sleep. Right. All right. Well, uh, I have a food one, but just for variety's sake, uh, we talked a little bit about fashion, and and I, I checked this one earlier. Imagine, uh, right for the picking or leave it on the tree. Top hats. Mm. <laughs> I think I'll leave that one on the tree. <laughs> I, I have, I have opinions about most things, but I have absolutely no opinion about top hats. I, I, I said I, I write these things as I go, and there is a mannequin over there wearing a top hat, and oh, it's yeah. the exact reason why it's on my <laughs> list. And I was like, huh, look at a, it's a mannequin, and which which they can be creepy yeah uh, yes and, and if you're not uh, uh, anticipating one being there and i looked and i was like why is he wearing a top hat i was like oh well, let me write that down on the list yeah and i saw today it's it's leaving leave it on the tree, on the tree for, for me, me. Uh, yeah but i can't pull off hats i do love mannequins and i've always wanted to simply like in a store 
go up to a mannequin and start talking to see how people would react. But I've never had the nerve. But again, to, to show the German mentality of the last two years, um, I just loved it when I saw uh, mannequins with masks on during the COVID mm. oh, time. Yes, yes. Yeah. There's a great Stay Doctor safe. Who episode about mannequins. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, we, we could do that. Uh, Doctor Who's, I'll leave it on the tree for me. Anyway, Dorothy <laughs> loves it, but I'm just whatever. Speaking of which, that's my next um, one, Star Trek. Mm. Is that ripe for picking for you or leave it on the tree? I think I've heard of that. <laughs> Is that sufficient? <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Got yeah. it. I, I, it's ripe for the picking for me. I've tried a couple of times to get my kids into Star Trek. Um, I watched all of Next Generation. Uh, it, it came right at that time in high school for me when it was actually on. It wasn't just reruns. And I had a physics teacher that would give us extra credit if we would watch a Star Trek episode and then explain oh. one part of the technology or something that was happening in the episode. Because it, it um, Gene Roddenberry loved physics, yeah. and and it was it was very well researched. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just good TV. It's it's very interesting. Um, they're they're working through all these kind of very human uh, situations. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's ripe for the picking for me. All the TV series, just leave them right on the tree. Mm. I like some of the older movies. I don't love the newer movies, but I find them entertaining. It's the same thing. It's like you know. It's different. I do like sci-fi stuff, but uh, you know, it's terribly hard to find Hogan's Heroes though anymore. Mm. <laughs> that's that's sort of the, for me the high point of okay. North American culture. Right. There we go. That's not even a, in reruns anymore. No, that's, that's <laughs> what I'm complaining about. I think about. I've heard of that show. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a couple of episodes. My my parents watched that. Yeah. It, it is one of these things where sometimes because. Uh, uh, in the historic faculty housing, we have block parties. We get together. I'm not always completely out of the loop because if all else fails, talk theology when we're having barbecue together. But I, I love sports, in particular football. I can't ever quite get anybody around here to bite on that. Uh, but then if we get into cultural things, not only did I grow up for a lot of my life in North St. Louis or on a military base when my dad was an uh, active duty Marine, but you know, I'm younger than most of staff and faculty around here. Uh, and so even from a generational standpoint, uh, sometimes we're just, you know, slightly missing what we watched. And if we compared what we liked to topics and things like that, they're probably similar, different in their approach and addressing the topics of life and stuff like that. But yeah, like I, friends that watch MASH, I, I, don't, I don't really like, uh, I just don't like old cinematography i'm not gonna lie yeah and it's I, I like if i listen to the content it's fine but old cinematography is just like well we have hd cameras and stuff like that now <laughs> so there's some there's some great classics out there yeah i know and i, I probably triggered a lot but. of people listening right now <laughs> uh, okay my last right for the picking or leave it on the tree and I, I i wrote this one down and it was one of those things where it's like well if i ask people they're going to ask me what's that but you'll know what it is marmite Oh, do you not know what Marmite is? No. Interesting. Okay. That's a that's an English it thing. It is. Yeah. Ger Germans would be repulsed it, <laughs> as they should it be. It is repulsive. <laughs> so this, legitimately what Marmite is, it's a, it's a fermentation byproduct. So it's literally waste, but somebody decided, and it's a spread. So they decided to put it in a jar and they spread it on sandwiches and things like that. Or they use it for, there's a, a chip called Twiglets, which are like Cheetos, that, and it's, it tastes like burnt fermented waste there's no other way to describe it i think it is foul and disgusting but dorothy the brit absolutely loves it and there's nothing worse for me i would well now it's leave it on the tree because you don't know what it is uh which well, anyway if anybody no, no, ever I, offers you marmite toast just say nah. no no well, thanks well i i i would like to take this up because is it the same thing as this um Ah, uh, in Scotland, haggis or uh, no? Ha haggis is nice. I don't know. Yeah, that's right for the picture for me. <laughs> it's some kind of ferment. It, isn't it um, a product of yeast? Yeah, and like so dead, yeah. dead yeast. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, uh, I I it's, was uh, I uh, day before yesterday I was um, one of the two external examiners on a PhD dissertation at the University of Aberdeen in, mm -hmm. in theology. Oh sure, and. Um, and that made me recall my one visit to Scotland. And I didn't think, 
you say haggis? I say haggis. I think yeah. it's, I think it is haggis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't think it was all that bad either. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. Yeah. 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 That's I, very good. I was because Dorothy would go on and on about haggis to me and all these British British cuisine. Oh, anyway, it's the reason why they've kind of just stolen everybody else's cuisine. Haggis is one of those things where I was very apprehensive. Finally tried it, and I was like, oh, it's it's, it's not bad at all. Yeah. But but Marmite, on the other hand, there's nothing worse when you go to a, a shop and you order a sandwich, like a bacon and cheese sandwich. And then that's what it says on the menu. But they've added Marmite as a uh, spread. It's like, why wasn't this listed <laughs> as an ingredient? There's no way I would have ever purchased this sandwich. And now i got to stomach through this gross thing because I paid five pounds for it. Well, I had a different, I had a different one. This will be my last one, too. But um, this, this conversation inspired me because um, I ask another uh, German cuisine uh, item, and that's schmalzbrot. Um, so for our, our hearers and listeners, uh, schmalzbrot is um, just lard bread. Yeah. Um, oh. Lard spread on bread. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I, I really like it. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't mess with the mic. Um, no, I... I uh, since I had these stents put in my heart mm. <laughs> 15 <laughs> years ago already, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm not supposed to eat that sort yeah, of thing. Sh- I mean, there's, don't you go know, well my together. my mother's, uh, my grandmother's uh, blutwurst. Oh, yeah. Was Blood nothing, sausage. yeah, was nothing that, that I could take. And mm. I finally learned to eat it and enjoy it. And then I, I had the stents put in and the cardiologist said no. Yeah. Uh, but there are all sorts of uh, those those things that actually my great 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 grandparents who worked in the field all day could eat that stuff and and right. it didn't harm them. That's right. right. Uh, probably it wouldn't be best for me. But I I uh, that that yeah, that's, with a little bit of green good. onion in it. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, and uh, a, a touch of lovely. salt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On on some nice crusty bread. Yeah, especially. Mm. Oh. Uh, uh, rye bread or, or uh, some kind of whole grain. Yeah, the yeah. first time that I had it when I was in um, Rotenburg op der Tauber, and I was at this uh, this tavern called Zur Hölle, <laughs> which which my German teacher uh, translated for us as portal to hell. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, I'll take the lard bread, please. <laughs> Can't forget that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hmm. I've never had it. I've never been to Germany. I, I meant to go to uh, Oberussel when I was studying at Westfield House uh, for a lecture and then for a couple other things. But right when I was going to take the first trip, Dorothy was overdue with our first son, and it felt irresponsible to yeah. leave my very pregnant wife for a trip to Germany. Uh, when you said schmaltz brot, I was like, well, I'm trying to like think of what it means. And the only part of it I understood was brot. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, yeah. Well, there we go. Uh, I, so I like buttered bread, and I imagine... Texture-wise, it's similar. The flavor profile might be different. I would say, for me, it would depend on where the lard came from. <laughs> if I'm yeah. gonna they use lard. they use some um, high quality uh, lard that's mm-hmm. not like grainy. It's it's yeah. really nice texture. Knowing Europe, there's oh yeah, it has to be yeah. fine quality yeah. to serve people. So I don't know. I, I try it when I go to Germany. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Cole, uh, this has been an excellent episode. Thank you for joining us. We could probably great continue fun. a conversation. You know, at some point maybe. Yeah, we should probably do maybe a series just so we can glean some of your knowledge for our podcast. Uh, but before we go, if you had one last piece of advice for anybody who was considering a career in church work, pastor, deaconess, teacher, DC, DCO, or anything like that, what would that, that piece of advice be? I recall one time in Confessions, I said on one day, I just really envy you. You're, you're going into the ministry. Um, and there's just nothing more exciting uh, in life. And the next day, I forget what we were talking about. And I said, you know, if you guys knew what you were getting yourselves into, you'd go find a job as a shoe salesman today. <laughs> Immediately, a hand shot up or more than one. Which is it? You just said the opposite <laughs> yesterday. And it's one of those, I suppose, Lutheran paradoxes that, um, that there's some heavy lifting in the ministry um, you uh, share experiences um, in which your only first response as a pastor can be to, to cry with them, to weep with them. Mm, wow. And and you um, and I, I, I reflect on, on a, a 
a half day I spent with a family whose uh, teenage daughter had just committed suicide. Mm. Um, I suppose in some ways one of the roughest days of my life but I still look back on that as satisfaction. I was their pastor. Wow. And um, the course that I took took me into academia, and I didn't have much time uh, in which anybody called me pastor. But, uh, but in those hours, I was their pastor. And um, there's nothing in the world that can substitute for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that um, <laughs> there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that goes into studying Greek and Hebrew or, or uh, trying to get your, your um, mind around some of these concepts of uh, administrative theory or, or uh, of exegetical theory or of uh, seemingly useless historical bits of information that the professor thinks are interesting. Um, but, but in a world that's hurting and a world that um, needs to hear what I think especially we in the Lutheran tradition have to offer. Um, this is the place to be. This is, the, this is where the real action in people's lives is. Wow. So uh, I can only encourage, encourage our listeners to, to seriously consider all the, all the options that, that we have now in public ministry in our church. Wow, so good. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you again for coming on. And as always, if uh, you're a listener or you're watching us on YouTube, uh, if you yourself are thinking about even on the very far edges, it's just maybe somebody said it to you or it's just kind of crossed your mind thinking about a career in church work, we'd love to be in contact with you. And if uh, you click the link in the description, it takes you to our request for information. Uh, and we don't know who you currently are and you fill out that form, uh, we'll send you a book. Uh, and if you're a parishioner, a pastor, alumni, and you're listening to the podcast and you know somebody who you think might be a good pastor or church worker someday, make sure to tell them uh, because that always goes a long way here in that uh, little bit of extra encouragement. But as we said uh, plenty of times on the podcast, you know, God works through external means and the Holy Spirit works through us. We never got to the Holy Spirit and justification and sanctification. I had another question too, but so we'll listeners, have to keep it sorry, for the next yeah, episode. You'll just have to wander, uh, but Dr. Copel, inevitably tell me and Ben, and we'll decide whether or not we share his wisdom with you later on. But uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us uh, and listening to us. If you're uh, on YouTube, make sure you like the seminary's webpage, uh, subscribe. I said webpage. Our YouTube channel, subscribe, uh, turn on bell notifications so you know when we're uploading new videos. Uh, and thank you for joining us, joining us today under the fig tree. We'll see you next time.